Dr. Chavez Henneco's presentation today uh, will be invisible in the time of COVID-19, what we all can do to help the Latino communities. And I think it's particularly relevant. Uh, we started planning this about uh, three weeks ago. Um, and it is, it has, I think it highlights the importance of being able to engage, to understand, and to uh, support uh, those who are um, perhaps less fortunate and um, present uh, than so many of us. Without further ado, let me introduce to you Dr. Diego Chavez Heneco. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, so I want to thank uh, Manuel and the Center for Latin American Studies, all the faculty, the staff, Jessica. Luz, Luis, uh, for having me. It is an honor to be able to share these ideas with you. And uh, more than a formal presentation, this will be a discussion about uh, kind of brainstorm about how can we help our own community. I'll be giving a formal presentation for the first 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll have a conversation about how can we help our communities. So as Manuel said, I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician. I'm an associate professor with the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And I'm also very proud of being an associate faculty with the Center for Latin American Studies. So the reason for this, uh, the, the, for the name of this talk, is based on the uh, book of uh, not the Nobel Prize, Garcia Marquez, who happened also to be from Colombia, uh, Love in the Time of Cholera. This is one of my favorite books. Uh, if you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it. It talks about another pandemic, uh, the pandemic of cholera. And one of the characters actually happened to be a physician. While it's not one of the main uh, principal characters, um, it does uh, involve all the measures that they were doing around the time of uh, this pandemic in Cartagena, Colombia. And of course, um, it's a love novel. So I, again, I highly encourage you to read this book if you have not. Um, it's a beautiful book uh, that describes a lot of the things from Cartagena. If you have been in Cartagena uh, and you read this book, it will bring you back to Cartagena. If you have not, if you ever visit Cartagena, I highly encourage you to read this book before you visit Cartagena. So there is there are, uh, one or two videos that I'm gonna encourage everybody to watch and we're gonna ask them to watch at a later time. And if we were gonna share it to assume there might be some uh, technical problems. So I don't wanna spend time on that, but as Manuel mentioned, these slides are gonna be available uh, to watch at a later time, the presentation entirely. So one of the things that you guys can do is go back to um, this link uh, which is basically a news clip from CBS. It was presented about a month uh, ago, and it talks about uh, Latino communities being hit hard by uh, coronavirus. And it's a very short piece, it's about two minutes, but what it caught my attention the most from this presentation is the final words of the presentation that are given by a community leader in Chicago. And the way that the video ends is with the following words. Um, the community leader is being asked why this should matter to everybody, why this should be important for the entire community. And, and as a matter of fact, more particular, they are asking about uh, whether we should take into consideration that maybe some of the members of the Latino communities are undocumented or not. And his answer is very clear and very pertinent to what we're talking today. And I'm gonna read it to you. This is a wartime situation. You're not, gonna to, you're not going to make anyone safer by having any portion of the population sick because you are going to be sick. So bottom line, whether we are Latinos or not, we should take care of everybody in our communities, uh, Latinos or not Latinos. And while we might have some uh, privileged conditions, uh, the fact that we are part of the human uh, race, the human beings, you know, it put us at risk by the fact that there might be some uh, segments of the population who are at higher risk. So this is true for Latino communities, this is true for African-American communities, and actually that gives relevance to the presentation that we're gonna have today. So some of the aims of this presentation, we're gonna review demographic characteristics of Latinos in the United States, in Pennsylvania, and in some Western Pennsylvania. We're not gonna review some epidemiological characteristics of COVID-19 in Latinos. We're gonna learn why Latinos are especially vulnerable to COVID-19. And we're gonna learn what academia and in general community members can do to support and help the Latino community through advocacy and through some community resources. Um, so this slide is up, uh, from the census, uh, the US census. Uh, as many of you know, we're encouraging everybody to answer the, two, the 2020 census. The census is done every 10 years. And actually these numbers are uh, some estimations. Uh, there is something that is done between uh, every 10 year census, which is the American Community Survey. So 
they do estimations based on previous census. They also use uh, fund surveys. And the 2018 American Community Survey tell us that we're close to 60 million of Latinos in the US and about 18% of the population. The other thing that I like to point out when I show this slide is something that is planted into my job. I'm a pediatrician, I work with children, and is that in general, the Latino community tend to be, tends to be a younger community than the mainstream community. So here you have ages in this uh, uh, y-axis uh, and then the percentage of the population in the x-axis. And as you can see, the mainstream population, you have this increase in the population, which are the baby boomers. And right now they're close to the age of 60 and maybe above. While the Latino population, the majority tend to be a younger population under the age of 18. So one third of the Latino population is under the age of 18. Well, only one fourth of the main uh, population is under the age of 18. Um, if we look at uh, areas like Southwestern Pennsylvania, Allegheny County, I will say that this is even lower, not only one fourth, but maybe one fifth. Um, this is in some ways good news because we know COVID-19 and coronavirus uh, has higher risk for uh, the segment of the population who is above the age of 50 and 60. But in the other hand, that's not the only risk factor. And actually in a few slides, we're gonna be talking about other risk factors. So while we are a young population, a young community, um, we do have other risk factors for COVID-19. Um, the other thing that I wonder if anybody in the audience is uh, wondering about this is um, why Latino population tend to be younger compared to the mainstream population. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, uh, people tend to migrate when they're younger, not necessarily when they're older and also because uh, natality rates, birth rates are higher in our community. Okay, so a few words about Latinos in the US. Um, the majority are citizens. The majority are children that are born in this country. The majority are second and third generation, meaning that their parents or their grandparents were the ones who migrated for the first time. And while the majority speak Spanish, also a large proportion of them also, or us also, uh, we speak English. Um, and then the majority of um, Latinos 25 years and older has at least a high school degree. So education is a big problem in our communities and there are some disparities in terms of education. But as you look at these numbers about high school, um, these are important numbers and there is uh, definitely some, some improvements when, com when compared to previous uh, decades. Uh, half of the Latinos in the United States are homeowners and then 19.5 uh, million vote in the last election. And I'm not talking about yesterday election, but in, in the general election. And then 25 million uh, are, will be eligible to vote uh, in November. So I make um, uh, a pitch for everybody to answer the census a few slides ago. I also wanna make a pitch for everybody who is eligible to vote to please vote in November. Uh, you know, we're talking about how can we help our communities? This is one of them, please vote. Um, now let's talk about Latinos in Pennsylvania. I particularly like this slide because it highlights one of the uh, important concept, which is the difference between race and ethnicity. So ethnicity talks about a group that shares same cultural traits, same language, this is Latinos. And uh, race talks about different uh, characteristics. And here you can see that you can be Latino and white, or you can be Latino and African-American, you can be Latino and Asian. And these are the numbers for the state of Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, we are close to 1 million Latinos and we represent 7.6% of the total population in the state of Pennsylvania. And again, this is based on the 2018 American Community Survey. Now, um, I also think that it's very interesting if you think about this slide that um, many of you have seen uh, for the last couple of months, the uh, daily briefings that the governor and uh, our um, uh, uh, health department secretary uh, does or, or they do on a daily basis. And when you see this press releases, you see that they do it by using uh, somebody who's doing sign language simultaneously. Well, the population in uh, Pennsylvania who's hearing impaired is anywhere between six to 8%. So the percentage is very similar to the Latino population in the state of Pennsylvania. However, and we have requests this to happen and we have asked in many ways to the state to accommodate, but we still don't see these press releases, we don't see these briefings with, um, simultaneous uh, interpretation into Spanish or with closed caption uh, titles in Spanish. So that's definitely um, an issue. And we're gonna be talking about how can we help the Latino community by improving and increasing the access to uh, information that is uh, appropriate, that is easily reachable, and that is in Spanish. As a matter of fact, um, about a month ago, uh, we did a presentation with Casa San Jose, 
in Spanish for the community, talking about COVID-19 and how to protect the community and how to protect individuals. Uh, this is not the objective for this presentation, but that's one of the things that we have done to help the community. So we're trying to start working to uh, make sure that um, resources are available in Spanish for the community. Um, things has improved, I have to say. Uh, when the pandemic start back in March, if uh, you happen to visit the website of the Department of Health and uh, the state of Pennsylvania, the governor's office, um, it was very interesting because they were using a very poor system of translation. And for those of you who speak Spanish will clearly understand this, the word in Spanish for uh, the wolf animal and the word for the last name wolf is exactly the same. So the software that they were using initially were translating that El Gobernador Lobo. So they were translating like governor and then there were as uh, the, the, the animal known uh, with, without making that much sense. Unfortunately, they changed that. Now they have a better uh, interpretation service for their website. And now it clearly states in Spanish, El Gobernador Wolf. So there have been some improvement over the recent weeks, over the recent months, but it's still, there is so much that we can still do better. In particular, this thing that I was mentioning in terms of um, simultaneous interpretation for briefing, press releases uh, in Spanish with closed caption. And this is true for the state, and this is true for the local level, for the county, and uh, all the counties in southwestern Pennsylvania. Now, a lot of these things change on a daily basis. Um, and one of the problems that we have had, and I'm gonna refer to this again in a few slides, is the fact that we don't have a good count about members in our community, uh, members of the Latino community who are experiencing uh, the symptoms or the diagnosis of COVID-19. And the reason why we are um, struggling with this is because there is not a good way to track uh, this testing, the testing that they are doing or the admission of the hospital. I have had conversations with the Allegheny County uh, Health Commissioner about this. They're working on this, um, but it's not perfect. Um, and things change on a daily basis. So up until about two weeks ago, the CDC didn't have anything about ethnicity. About two weeks ago, uh, some data was starting to show up and they actually put disclaimers about that they don't have all the uh, data for all the cases uh, in terms of ethnicity. So here, this is like that, it, that uh, it was available up until about three or four days ago on the CDC website. And at that time, they were telling us that 30.1% uh, um, of the cases were Latinos, while 69.9% were non-Latinos. And that was on a data collected of uh, close to uh, one and a half million people uh, with ethnicity only uh, being available for uh, 657,000 of this uh, uh, testing or of this sample. So that was definitely a limitation. It's improving, it's changing on a day by day basis. This specific slide is no longer available on the CDC and actually, this morning I was looking about what they are posting today and what they have switched is a very interesting model that I'm not sure that is better or not, but I'm gonna share it with you guys. Um, basically, what they have now is they have a mix between race and ethnicity. So now they are showing the number of cases, for example, for uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, I'm pointing to here, the 1.2% who are non-Latinos, Asian non-Latinos 4.2, uh, African Americans non-Latino 22.3, and then you have Latinos, which is 32.6%. In the previous slide, I was talking about uh, 30, 31%. Now it's 32.6%. Regardless, if you think about it, I mentioned earlier that in the United States, we are only 18% of the population. And yet, we have overrepresentation in the number of cases, close to 32% of the cases. So this is evidence how hard this pandemic has hit at our community and members of our community. And again, uh, this is something that is available on the website from the CDC today, where they are mixing race and ethnicity. So we're thinking that, you know, if you're black or African-American, but yet you are Latino, you would be in these numbers. And of course the numbers are higher in that regard. They, I'm not sure if it's better or not to have the mix between races and ethnicity, but that's how they're presenting it right now. And again, they're giving the disclaimer that it's not on everybody that they have the information about ethnicity or race. Okay, so we just talked about the United States. Let's talk about Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania, up until this morning, I checked in the website this morning, had nothing on their website about the ethnicity. Uh, however, they are uh, releasing this weekly report, and I believe it was the first report two weeks ago, dated May 22nd, that for the first time they were showing ethnicity. Uh, this is from last Friday, where they still showing ethnicity, and it's a weekly report that they sent. Um, and in that report, they were talking about uh, the presence of um, uh, COVID-19 on the Hispanic population and the numbers were not that high and the percentage was not that high but still I think it's an improvement to start to disclose some of the data. We have been making a big effort 
to make sure that the authorities at many levels, at the local level, at the county level, at the state level, disclose most of this information because that's part of our invisibility. We're invisible because people don't know that we exist. When I came 20 years ago to Pittsburgh, 22 years ago to uh, Pittsburgh, um, I heard that there were no Latinos in Southwestern Pennsylvania, and I'm looking right now, last time that I saw, we were 66 in this presentation, and who knows how many of us uh, are Latinos. Uh, I'll show you some specific demographics of our, our area, but certainly there is a lot of us in this area, so we do exist. And then the second point is, you know, it's very clearly to jump into a conclusion, well, there is no COVID in Latinos if we're not counting it. And that's part of the invisibility. Unless we start counting ourselves in general through a census or other means, and unless we start counting how many of our, uh, of our the members of our community are experiencing this condition, otherwise we're not gonna be able to realize uh, the specific numbers are we're gonna continue to be invisible. And if we're invisible, we can not address the needs of our community. Um, I will have to make an exception with the state of Pennsylvania, and that is Philadelphia. Philadelphia, since early uh, uh, days of the pandemic, start to release information about the Latino population. And this is actually current in the website of the uh, city of Philadelphia uh, from the um, health department. And every day at 1 p.m., they update this presentation. So this, this um, demographic. So today at 1 p.m., they developed this, and it's about 9.4% of the population of Philadelphia are reporting uh, cases with COVID-19. Um, it's a significant number. I don't have the specific demographics in general for the community of Philadelphia. But again, if you think about it, if we compare it to a state, the state is 7.2%. This is a very high number. And I'm not sure if it's truly overrepresentation, but it's still, it's a very significant number. Okay, so Latinos and COVID-19. So kind of uh, with the previous numbers I have shown you um, how uh, we are at high risk of contracting COVID-19. Uh, this is true because of many characteristics that I'm gonna explain in a minute, but it also has to do with what we call social determinants. So social determinants are things related to, for example, socioeconomic status, employment. We're gonna be talking about those in a minute. Uh, and also we're gonna talk about how Latinos and our community is not a high risk for the condition of COVID-19, but also a higher, a higher risk for uh, conditions that are called social determinants, such as food insecurity, unemployment, et cetera. Um, there is also not only a higher number of cases in the Latino community for COVID-19, but a higher mortality in the Latino communities. So kind of to summarize what I have been uh, shown with previous slides, 18% of the population in the United States is Latinos, but 27% of all COVID-19 deaths have been attributed to our community. So definitely our representation. And there are places and there are cities and states that have been doing a much better job than uh, Pennsylvania and Allegheny County and Pittsburgh in terms of reporting this. And one of those examples is New York City. In New York City, the Latino population is 29%. 39% of all the deaths in New York City are in Latinos. So definitely our representation, unfortunately, in our community. So um, why this happened? And uh, the reason is, there are many reasons why we are high risk uh, for COVID-19. One is because our communities, uh, members of our communities tend to have in higher numbers, essential jobs. So there is a lot of people who work in healthcare, there are doctors, there are medical assistants, and there are nurses, pharmacists. So a lot of people working in essential works in healthcare, but that's not the only type of jobs that uh, members of our community uh, hold. So many people who work in the service uh, industry, many people who work in food services, in restaurants, many people who work in food packing plants. As a matter of fact, there are uh, some local food packing plants, uh, plants um, in our uh, area in southwestern Pennsylvania. People who work in construction, those are workers that are considered being essential, and because they're essential, they have a lower possibility to work from home. And therefore, by having a lower possibility to work from home, they have a higher chance uh, for uh, social contacting and a higher risk for um, contracting the condition. Um, only 49% of Latinos have health insurance. And this is a huge problem. And this is another um, place where I can ask for um, your advocacy. So um, I will tell you, we run a free clinic. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have the program Salud Para Niños. And um, we have a free clinic that would provide health care for children who don't have health insurance. 2019 was the year in record, 18 years that we have been doing this, and that we have the highest numbers in our free clinic, the higher numbers of uninsured kids that we saw. And there are many reasons for this. Unfortunately, over the last four years, many people have lost insurance. Many people have choose not to apply for insurance. 
because of uh, concerns about uh, their immigration implications. Bottom line, we're seeing more and more people who are uninsured. Um, we knew this before this pandemic. And as a matter of fact, these numbers were being reported that the number of uninsured people in the United States, not only Latinos, but in general, the number of uninsured people in the United States was increasing. And the response from the federal government was that the numbers were showing like that is because more people were getting jobs, uh, unemployment was going lower, and therefore people were getting insurance through their uh, through employers. And we know that that's not true. Uh, we see that a lot of people are dropping their uh, medical assistance, the state health-based insurance, and actually they are not choosing to either re-enroll or they no longer can afford to pay for these insurances. So bottom line, we're seeing more and more people without health insurance. Not having health insurance is a big problem because if you don't have health insurance, then you don't have health care access. If you don't have health care access, you don't have access to preventive care that are going to prevent some of the conditions that put you at risk for COVID-19. And some of those conditions include such as things such as diabetes and obesity. The Latino population and Latinos in general in the United States have higher risk than the general population to have conditions such as diabetes and obesity. And this is something that we all need to work very careful in our communities, in our families, in individual basis. We need to do everything that we can do to avoid obesity in our communities, to avoid diabetes in our communities. Our numbers are as concerning as the numbers of um, Native American tribes. Uh, I have here about the Navajo tribe, and they're actually having high problems with COVID-19 because of similar reasons. We also have higher risk for social contacting, and it has to do with our cultural practices and also the way that we live, and we're gonna be talking about that in a minute. And finally, while the risk for cardiovascular conditions and hypertension might not be higher in the Latino population, although somebody can argue that diabetes and obesity put your high risk for cardiovascular condition and hypertension, what we know for sure is that when Latinos have cardiovascular conditions and hypertension, they tend to have these conditions poor control due to a lack of healthcare access or lack of insurance. And of course, if these conditions are not um, controlled, you're at higher risk to having uh, COVID-19 and having sequelas, severe sequelas, more morbidity, mortality with COVID-19. That's what it has shown us the data from people who have been hospitalized and the data from mortality, people from who have gone to the ICU unit ventilators. They usually have these risk factors, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular conditions. Okay, so more words about uh, Latino, a characteristic of the Latino community. Uh, you guys have heard this on the news all the time. Unemployment rates are skyrocketing. The latest that I hear was close to 20%. Uh, when I checked these last numbers uh, for the uh, general population was around 14.7% and for Latino uh, population was 19%. So we're probably five points above, four to five points above whatever the unemployment rate is. So if they're talking that now the unemployment rate could be 20%, uh, maybe in the Latino population could be as high as 24, 25%. So definitely really high. One in four, one in five Latinos might not currently have a job and it's really, really high. And it's also uh, really high in the way that uh, Latinos don't qualify uh, for things such as unemployment insurance. And we're gonna talk about that. We did talk about the higher numbers of jobs in service industry, hospitality, uh, office, farming, etc. cetera. Uh, there are some difficult situations in rural areas of our state. This is in the middle uh, part of the state, Chandler, Franklin County, Pennsylvania, but also that happened as well here in Southwestern Pennsylvania. And I have mentioned before the lack of information about COVID-19, and that has to do with the lack of uh, media in Spanish, the lack of trusted uh, information that reach our communities. We have tried to work on that by the uh, webinar that we did in Spanish a few weeks ago with uh, Casa San Jose and with UPMC. But the more that we can do in order to provide reliable and trusted information, the better. Um, if you go into social media, you will see that there is a lot of misinformation, a lot of um, uh, misguidance about how you can prevent COVID or where is the origin of COVID and things like that. And that's a problem. And also, there is not appropriate and um, uh, um, uh, well-guided information that will help the families to be safe and to be healthy. Um, now, the next couple of quotes um, were uh, made by uh, Veronica Escobar, who is a Texas representative member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, she's in San Antonio. And when she was talking about this, she was saying that this is something that Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the Institute of Allergy and Immunology at the NIH, uh, mentioned to her. And uh, basically he was telling her that the Latino community should be treated the same way that other vulnerable communities are being treated, comparable to nursing homes and people who live in assisted living uh, facilities. And that includes testing and tracing of minority communities. So that's what has been recommended. And as many of you know, up until recently, we were having problems of having 
more uh, available testing. The good news is that this is improving, that this is uh, getting better. And as a matter of fact, last week, there were uh, some testing being done in some target areas in some particular neighborhoods of our community, Beachview, Brookline, Northside. So now it's much, much easier to get a test, even without a doctor's order. They're asking people if, if you want to have the test, just walk in and there are many sites. And if anybody's interested in this, just go to the ways, website of the Allegheny County Health Department, um, ACHD.net, and you will see where you can get tested. And there are many places where you can be tested um, for um, COVID-19 and you don't need a doctor's order, you can just walk in. And then finally, um, we put a lot of emphasis in increasing availability of information. I mentioned this already, and advocacy. And there are many things that you can do in advocacy. Things that you can do at the personal levels, things that um, encourage everybody to do, such as answer the census, make sure you vote, um, make sure that if you can support um, the, it's called the dream care. And dream care is the making sure that all kids in Pennsylvania, regardless of immigration status, have health insurance. So we can support that initiative that is being run at the state level, that would be great. And any other ways that you can advocate for our community better. Uh, the idea that we speak for those who don't have a voice. And a lot of members in our community usually don't have a voice. And um, those of us who have a voice, we should be make, make uh, we should make sure that we are being heard. Now, um, moving forward, um, this is from the uh, Migration Policy Institute. And I want to make the note that all these numbers come for immigrants, and not every not all Latinos are represented here, and not all uh, immigrants are Latinos. But basically, they are talking about the effects of the uh, Stimulus Act, the CARE Act. And basically, 15.4 million of people didn't receive this uh, stimulus payment because they are in what they call mixed status families. So families who maybe one of the members is not a US citizen or didn't meet the criteria. So for example, 9.9 uh, million of unauthorized immigrants wouldn't qualify for this um, stimulus package. 3.7 million of children that, despite the fact that they are US citizens or green card holders, they wouldn't qualify because of the immigration status of their parents. Uh, 1.7 million of spouses that, while being U.S. citizens, because of their husband not being U.S. citizens, they wouldn't qualify. Uh, in total, 5.5 million of U.S. citizens uh, and green card holders were excluded from this relief because of this status of being in mixed families. So a lot of people didn't benefit from uh, the Incentive uh, uh, Care Act. And also, a lot of our members in our community won't qualify for uh, on, um, unemployment insurance. And that's a big problem uh, because these are people who are going for months now without receiving any type of payment, any type of salary, any type of uh, financial support, at least from the federal government. I'm gonna share with you guys in a few minutes uh, some things that are being done at the local level. It's not a lot, but it's something that is helping uh, families and community members. Um, this is from the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And I really like that they label it with the way that it is. They are talking about here about racial disparities. And among racial disparities, they talk about exposure uh, risk at work, that I mentioned why, exposure risk in public transportation. So a lot of the members in our community rely on public transportation, public transit, and we know that that's a high area of, um, we have problems with exposure at risk at work, exposure in public transportation, exposure uh, which are living in spaces. And this is huge because we in the medical community sometimes give advice about, oh, well, if somebody in the, in the family is being diagnosed with COVID, or if somebody in the family is suspected to have COVID, what you need to do is to isolate that member of the family in one room. And while it's so easy to say that, we know that this is not necessarily possible in many of our vulnerable minority communities, not only Latino communities, but sometimes African-American communities and other less uh, privileged. So many of the members of our communities live in big family groups that they only share a room. That's it, only one room for everybody, and there is no way to, to isolate somebody in another room because that's all what they have. And the same thing with the bathroom. They only have one bathroom. Uh, I, we did talk about comorbid and health conditions, access to healthcare and tests, testing. I really like that uh, the Bingham and Women Hospital um, in Boston actually named it with something uh, that it is, that is racism in healthcare delivery. And then they talk about chronic stress. And in pediatrics, we talk about another concept that is called toxic stress. If you had been exposed to some kind of toxic stress, some kind of um, a stressful situation socially, that might actually affect in kids uh, their development, but also might affect your response, for example, your immune response to different conditions. So just to give some examples, immigrants, sometimes their process of immigration into this country is a very traumatic process. 
or they are immigrating because they have been victims of violence or displacement, uh, or they come as refugees, uh, or actually family members who are victims of domestic violence or abuse, um, or even in the case of Puerto Ricans, that while they are citizens, they have come to the States and to the main continent and to Pennsylvania and to Pittsburgh, running from other stressful situations, such as Hurricane Maria, such as the earthquake. So many members in our community have experienced chronic stress, toxic stress, that actually also make them more vulnerable for um, this kind of condition, this kind of pandemic. Um, how can we help these families? So when I was talking to my colleagues, the pediatricians, I was telling them the importance of collecting transparent data in terms of age, sex, race, ethnicity, primary language, and socioeconomic status. And if we cannot collect that information with the socioeconomic status, at least a proxy by zip code. I know that sometimes zip code can be used as a proxy for socioeconomic status, but the more that we can do to track and to make visible our community, the better. So at the beginning of this presentation, I was talking about um, the problem with testing and reporting COVID-19 in, in the Latino community. This is a way that we can help our community by making better the way that we're tracking the cases in our community. Just by doing that, it's a, it's a big improvement. I also talk about uh, social determinants of health and screening for social determinants of health. And I will tell you, um, in pediatrician's office and in our practice, it's very common, and this is something that the American Academy of Pediatrics is supporting to screen for the needs of, of the members of the family, for the needs of the member of the community. So it's not uncommon that somebody comes with their kid because the child may have an ear infection or need their vaccinations or need just a regular checkup. But we're asking more and more these days, and even before the pandemic, is everybody able to eat? Do you have enough food at home? Does everybody have a job? Do you need help? And actually, we try to help as much as we can. As for example, in our uh, office, in our clinic, we have a partnership with the food bank, and we have some food boxes of non perishable items that we can provide to families if they need it. Obviously, it's not that much, and it's more uh, for like an emergency. And the idea is that they should help uh, these um, foods, uh, these non perishable foods, should help while making the bridge to some more stable resources. I like more stable resources from the food bank and other that I'm going to mention in a moment. Um, the other thing that we're encouraging is that when people don't speak the second language, to use appropriate ways to communicate with families. So the use of interpreter, interpretation services, the use of certified interpreters, um, that definitely will help. And I mentioned before how we would like to see the media um, and then the press releases made by the governor and by the county uh, with the Spanish with closed captions. Um, develop communication tool for patients with disabilities. I was very interested about this because it was mentioned by the Harvard um, uh, Women and Women, uh, Birman and Women Hospital, but I also thought that this was important for us who have English as a second language. So many years ago, actually in class, I was listening to this presentation about how uh, uh, students who have English as a second language tend to read lips. And while here they're uh, advocating for use of clear masks, uh, for uh, people with disabilities who are doing definitely uh, lip reading, uh, I was thinking that having clear uh, masks, face masks with clear windows, um, it will help people who have English as a second language because without realizing it, uh, many of us tend to read lips um, and we do it and this will help with communication. Uh, in our clinic, we have photos of our team in the waiting room and we try to involve diverse personnel. So in our clinic, we have people from many countries of Latin America who try that to make that connection uh, in terms of culture and, and language with our patients. Um, so what can we tell the community? I've been talking about the importance of uh, um, conveying a, an appropriate message for the community. So really important that we recommend to avoid physical contact. It's not about avoiding social distancing, uh, uh, social contact. You know, right now we're having social contact through this media, to Zoom. Um, we want people to still be connected. Connected is really important. Having community connection is really important. But yet, it is really important that we have that physical distancing, in particular, the six feet apart, the two meters distance. You know, um, on Friday, we're gonna be going to Green in Allegheny County and in other surrounding counties. Uh, this is not like a green light to do back to what we used to do six months ago, but less is a reminder to maintain that physical distancing when we go to the stores, when we go to work. Um, really, really important that we remind this uh, for people. And we recommend, in particular, because this is very common in our culture, some uh, demonstrations or uh, um, um, caring and love and physical interaction. So we're so used to handshaking, hugs, kisses. Just last week, I had somebody from the community that I was seeing, and he right away went to shake my hand. And you know, in other days, I would have hesitated, but now you know, I had to go in. We no longer do this, unfortunately. 
and who knows when we might be able to do that again. But really important, we remind ourselves and that we remind our members in our community that handshaking, hugging, kissing um, is not the best uh, during the current time. Uh, we want to recommend to avoid social and physical events. Even if we move to the green phase, there are some indications from the governor um, in the way that they should be done. And when we were in the uh, red phase and in the yellow phase, definitely to discourage events such as quinceañeras, graduations, anniversaries. What I saw in the community that people were okay uh, I, uh, maintaining the quarantine at home, staying at home, physical distance, etc. But when it came to this, uh, particular events, for some reason, people thought that it was okay to make exceptions. And we saw pictures in social media of, of uh, people celebrating parties, people celebrating quinceañeras, and unfortunately, that's not the best thing that we can do at this time. So we need to remind members in our community to please avoid doing the celebrations. It's not canceling the celebration. It's not um, uh, uh, avoiding the celebration. It's just postponing the celebration. And in the meantime, finding other ways to celebrate, um, uh, maybe virtual. Uh, we want to recommend to avoid physical contact with family members. That's another thing. We have seen in our community that people are okay of maybe maintaining that physical distancing, but they tend to make exceptions with family members. And family members shouldn't be an exception. If the family members don't live in the same household, we should try to maintain that physical distancing and avoid it. So I had a family who was saying, well, we, we got together with my family, it's their family. Yeah, but where do they live? Oh, they live close by. Well, what is close by? 15 minutes away. That shouldn't happen. That's not a good idea. And same thing with traveling. For some reason, people thought uh, in our community that traveling was okay. And we have a lot of people in our community who have members who live in the state of New York or in the state of Maryland or in Florida or in California, and they're traveling. And actually that's the way that the virus has been uh, transmitted throughout the country by traveling. We know that the virus, virus came to the United States from other countries, from China, from France, from Spain. And we know that the virus came to the state of Pennsylvania from other states. So we need to avoid and discourage travel as much as we can. Uh, similar to what I was mentioning before in terms of uh, social gatherings, uh, for some reason, religious gatherings uh, uh, became an exception. And right now, different religious congregations have different guidelines. And uh, you know um, they're doing celebrations in uh, parking lots, in open air. They have different guidelines. We need to try to um, stay with those um, guidelines. And we as Latinos, we love to you know, go for lunch or go for dinner after, after we attended mass. It's another thing that we need to think twice under the current circumstances. Um, when, uh, we need to recommend that somebody is at home, also take into account special considerations that people might only have a single room for the entire family. And if that's the case, what we need to do is try to isolate as much as we can in a special area of this room. So just having that person using that specific corner of the room and then kind of isolate what we can isolate. So if we can isolate the bathroom, great. If we have two bathrooms, having one bathroom for the person who's sick and the other uh, bathroom for the ones who are not. If we only have one bathroom, we need to do frequent cleaning after that person who, that we are concerned or tested positive with the bathroom. That way it's not transmitted among the members of the family. We need to isolate bed, uh, beds and bathroom clothes. That's an easy way to do it. No sharing bed, no sharing clothes. And then to isolate place and utensils, that's another way to isolate that person that I might be practical. Uh, a few words about Latinos in Southwestern Pennsylvania. This is the city of Pittsburgh. Many of you have seen this slide before. Um, in the brown circles we have where members of our community are. While there are some neighborhoods that is growing the most, the community beach of Brooklyn, we know because of the patients that we see that everybody, Latinos are all over around our area. And in blue we have the areas where we provide services in Oakland, in Lawrenceville, and in the South Side. Some unique characteristics of our community had to do with the lack of barrio or neighborhood, although I just mentioned that Beachview, Brooklyn, some of the areas are increasing, disproportionate between education and income, and as well as country of origin. Up until 2000, um, the majority of uh, Latinos in Southwestern Pennsylvania were South and Central Americans. Um, by 2010, the majority were Mexican Americans. We're looking forward to see what the census of 2020 shows us. We know that there had been a huge increase in uh, the Puerto Rican community. Um, but you know, it's a mix. And what is interesting from Southwestern Pennsylvania is that it's very different to central Pennsylvania and to Philadelphia where the majority for sure are Puerto Ricans. Okay, uh, some other words about Southwestern Pennsylvania. There has been a steady increase in our population compared to the general population. The general population for many years was going in the opposite direction, going down or in the best case scenario, not changing. Our population, the Latino population in Southwestern Pennsylvania in the seven counties has continued increasing. And the latest number for the population survey tell us that we are close to 42,000 Latinos in Southwestern Pennsylvania, and one third of them close to 12,000 uh, under the age of eight. 
Now, there are some places where families can get, um, and members of our community can get reliable information. So the Center for Disease Control, the CDC has a 1-800 number and it's, uh, they have an option in Spanish that is available. The county has this phone number that is also available in interpretation services. Uh, 211 is a really good resource and they actually have 1-800 numbers for each county and that's something that we're also promoting. And we're also promoting the use of our uh, clinic uh, where we have an option eight uh, for people who speak only Spanish and they can talk to us about their health of their children. Uh, for people who are having food insecurities, a uh, couple of initiatives, you guys have here about the people focused schools. They have the grow, grab and go meals and there the information is available on the website. We have the Greater Community Food Bank and Food Pantries, they also have the website there. Um, not sure how many of you guys know about the WIC program, but WIC stands for Women, Infant and Children. This is a service that is from the federal government and it provides, and is managed by the counties. So Allegheny County has the WIC office and they provide food uh, support for families who have children under the age of five or women who are pregnant. And this is a service that about 50% of the population rely on. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, some of the offices were closed or were operating by the schedule. So uh, what we encourage is everybody to call before they go to see whether their office is open or whether they need to go to a different office than the one that they usually use. Um, perhaps one of the most important things from this presentation is what we have available in terms of community resources. Many of you might know about this, many of you don't, but I wanna make a big pitch for Casa San Jose, for the Latino Family Center, for the Latino Community Center. They're doing an amazing job. Um, and then um, I'm gonna share some of the things that they have been doing. Again, I'm not gonna spend time on the videos, but this is a video from uh, Casa San Jose. And in this video, they're showing what they're doing. So Casa San Jose was able to um, get some donations and they were able to provide a specific financial support for families. It was not the $1,200 uh, that the federal government was paying to all families, but it was some cash money that they have been giving to families. And if you look at this video, uh, you will see how families come to Casa San Jose and they have different stations where they will get food from the food bank, where they will get different flyers about how to protect themselves from COVID-19, the use of masks. They will get information about the census. They will get information about other uh, social services, uh, prevention of domestic violence, et cetera. And then they will get a cash uh, or a check that will help them. Uh, it's not a lot of money, but it's something. And, you know, uh, a big applause for what Casa San Jose is doing because they have been doing a great job on a daily basis. Um, they also had this initiative that I thought it was very interesting. Um, I participated with them in this, and it's basically to support our local restaurants. And I also want to make a big pitch about this. Um, I mentioned before that I came to Pittsburgh 22 years ago. When I first came to Pittsburgh in 1998, there was only one, one Mexican restaurant in Monrovia. That was it. And we made a big deal about going for lunch after mass on Sundays. Now we're so lucky that we have such a diverse uh, uh, possibility of uh, uh, restaurants in our area. We have Peruvian restaurant, we have Colombian restaurant, we have Venezuelan restaurant, we have Dominican restaurants, we have Argentinian restaurants. Um, uh, we are probably missing uh, more Puerto Rican restaurants, Cuban restaurants, but their options are much more. And the majority of these businesses are small businesses owned by members of the community. So with some uh, monetary donation made to Casa San Jose, Casa San Jose purchases uh, food in these restaurants to distribute to the community. And this is great because through this way, not only we're supporting the local businesses, the local restaurants, but we're also uh, feeding the people who need it the most. It's not a lot, it's not uh, equivalent to um, providing uh, groceries, but it definitely helps and it helps our restaurants and obviously we want these restaurants to survive this pandemic. Um, some other resources available, we know that in this time of crisis, uh, domestic violence is a problem, child abuse is a problem, so there is the phone number from the uh, Women's Shelter of Pittsburgh. They have an option in Spanish, option three. Uh, Pittsburgh again, a, a Action Against Rape. They also have an option in Spanish. They have therapies in Spanish. The information is there. And then for people who are experiencing a crisis, a mental health crisis, depression, anxiety. As a matter of fact, we all are. They talk about the second epidemic, which is not COVID, but it's mental health. Um, you, we have the option of uh, using the result crisis phone number, one eight 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 seven. you can 24 seven, they have uh, um, interpreters available and this is uh, free and anybody can use it. And you know, it's a very good resource. And with that, I'm gonna stop, I'm sorry, run over time, but I think we still have some minutes for uh, questions and answer. Uh, and I welcome any questions, any thoughts um, in ways that we have, can help uh, our communities. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Diego. Uh, that was great. And uh, you, did, you did go through a lot of information in a very short period of time. Uh, I hope that everybody was able to watch the whole presentation from beginning to end. There are a couple of questions that uh, surfaced during the presentation. And um, I wanted to start with, with one of them, which uh, related to the methods. This is from Felicia Alexander, who um, requested or asked, uh, how uh, do you screen for, um, for uh, socioeconomic determinants? So um, kind of what I was mentioning before in our clinic, um, we do ask about uh, the need uh, for food, the unemployment. Um, the one thing that I think is critical in our community is because the mainstream culture is more direct. And in the mainstream culture, not the Latino culture, if somebody needs something, they will tell you, you know, we're struggling, we don't have food. But for some reason, and I make a big emphasis, and this is something that we all should share with our community members, um, um, is there is no shame about asking for help. There is no shame about recognizing that we're struggling, that, that we need help. So um, it's very important that we are proactive and they, we as families, uh, and this, you don't have to be a provider or a professional to afford this, but you know, talk to your friends, talk to your community members and ask them, are you doing okay? Do you have enough food? Do you have enough, uh, everybody has a job? Because people sometimes feel for some reason, and this is very inherent to our culture, that you know, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, uh, it is a shame if I have to ask for help. It is a shame if I have to recognize that I lost my job. It is a shame if I have to recognize that we don't have enough food. So let's be all be proactive, ask our community members if they're doing okay, and offer uh, concrete solutions. And I gave some of this in the PowerPoint presentation, some of the resources, Carlos San Jose, the food bank, et cetera. So yeah, let's be proactive and let's ask. And you know, it can be as casual, you know, and, and the other way to make it less um, direct, you can actually put on yourself, you know, actually at home, right now, somebody lost a job, we might not be earning as much as we used to earn three months ago. It hasn't been that easy. It hasn't been that easy to go to a supermarket. Are you having any problems like that? Are you experiencing anything like that? And that might start a conversation where people more feel more comfortable about sharing. And obviously, we know that information. We should be able to help more other members in our community. Great. Um, there, there's another question from uh, Greg Yost. Uh, and I will read it literally as he wrote it uh, so that uh, you might think about it. Uh, so is there any evidence that racial or ethnic um, matters that are not socially determinative uh, of a no social non-social determinative nature are at play in the corona crisis? Uh, in other words, uh, for example, as Europeans are more, uh, European descendants tend to be more prone to skin cancers uh, when socioeconomic situations mm -hmm. are factored out, do any populations show any greater or lesser likelihood of infection independent of uh, socioeconomic determinants of health? That is a really good question. And the truth is that we don't know. We just don't know. Um, I guess there might be some genetic factors. We don't know that. There could be some genetic factors who protect some people and make more vulnerable other people. We know age is one of the um, determinants. So younger people tend to be better. I mentioned the other ones that we know. But in all honesty, the truth is that if anything COVID has taught us is that we have to be humble because there is so many things that we don't know and things change on a daily basis. So even if I had some information today that I could share with you guys, it might not be true or relevant by tomorrow. So things are changing. I think it's a really good question and it's a big, really good aspect. If it's, in fact, there is some biological genetic determinants that predispose um, a segment of the population, my um, thinking is that they're not, they're not going to be alone. So the things that we show, they are clear for infectious disease. So when you have more social contacting, when you tend to share or have more members of the same family in the same room, when you have to have these jobs that are high exposure, you're more prone. So they, they are definitely there. I don't think those are going to change in the future. Things that are not going to change are basically things such as washing hands, social distancing, using a mask. That's not going to change. But yeah, do we know whether on top of that, there might be some genetic or biological factors the truth that we don't know, and studies in the future will tell us that. And it will tell us as well how we respond for treatment and vaccines, et cetera. So I think it's a really good question, and it's something that we will be learning over the next couple of months, over the next couple of years. Great, great. And I, I should say, and, and there's not uh, necessarily a plug for us. On the, on the contrary, there's a plug for the businesses that we have been trying to amplify uh, the channel for. Uh, since uh, March, we've been also, we've had this listing in our newsletter that we publish every week for uh, businesses that you can support that are associated with the Center for Latin American Studies, primarily 
the festival, but also some uh, that uh, we are affiliated with. And so, you know, if you want a short uh, list, or we, I promise we get nothing from it more than supporting those of us who are in our community. Um, yeah, we, we know that the big exchange business, big restaurants, they're probably going to survive. But we're really worried about the small businesses. And yes, the Center for Latin American uh, Studies is a great resource. I will encourage you to visit the website and visit all the resources that they have available because, yes, they do have a list of businesses that everybody can support. So I highly encourage everybody to think about those businesses. Okay, and there's a question from Marty. Um, in terms of advocacy, uh, what is needed most in your opinion, Diego? So I gave some points on some ideas or things that you can do practical. Um, you know, I hope many of you or everybody who could vote yesterday voted yesterday. And of course, we want everybody to vote in November. So please vote. Vote is one of the most important things that we can do. If you're a citizen, you can vote. Please vote in November. Second thing, make sure you answer the census. The census is really important because knowing how, how, how many we are, that's a way that we make ourselves less invisible. If you have the opportunity, if you see there are some emails circulating about how to support this green care, which is the idea to support, uh, um, to ask our legislature to support uh, universal health care for everybody, that would be another idea. Um, there are many ways that advocacy is being done at the local, at the regional, at the state level. Uh, Casa San Jose is also very involved, the Latino Family Center, the Latino Community Center. So, you know, the more that we can make our community less invisible, more visible to the eyes of everybody. The more that we have a voice, the better that we're going to do. And so some just ideas, I'm pretty sure there are many more, but some thoughts and some things that are easy to do, just answer the, answer the census, vote, those kind of things. Thank you so much, Manuel. I would like to end probably to thanking again the Center for Latin American Studies for what you guys do. When I was showing that slide that we tend to be a committee that don't live in the same neighborhood or in the same barrio, we do find ways that we get together and that are central. So churches sometimes is one of them. Class, Center for Latin American Studies for sure is one of them. Probably one of the biggest gatherings that we have for Latinos in the city, in the region, uh, it's uh, the festival. And we're looking forward and we don't know what is gonna happen. Hopefully we can do it, but we're looking forward for future festivals. Uh, if it doesn't happen this year in September, probably will happen next year. Uh, he has been around for, uh, if I remember correctly, 45 years. So. I want to thank uh, class, the faculty, the students for all what you do, the staff, uh, Luis, um, Luz, um, Jessica, everybody who is part of class because you guys are a tremendous presence in the community and you do a lot for the community. And again, I want to encourage everybody to think about our friends, our families, our neighbors. I want to encourage everybody to ask, to share stories. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be public, but you know, talk to your friends and ask them, are you guys doing okay? Uh, if you have some struggles, share the struggles with them because that might make them more uh, humble about sharing their own struggles. And again, I want to emphasize, please, there is no shame about asking for help. We as Latinos, we tend to keep our face and sometimes don't ask for help. And um, you know, I, I always tell the story that when I was growing up, my mom told me that if you wanted to be a polite Latino, you don't say yes right away and you don't ask for things, you wait until things are offered to you and you only say yes after the third or fourth time. Uh, and while that might be very nice and maybe polite, it might be not practical in times of crisis like this. So let's make sure that everybody gets the help that they need, that everybody's helping everybody. We are all together in this. Um, and I cannot emphasize more on that. And, you know, hopefully everybody's going to be health, uh, healthy. I want to wish everybody, everybody's families, your families here in Pittsburgh, your families here in Southwestern Pennsylvania, your families here back in uh, Latin America. I want to wish everybody to be healthy and safe. Uh, I'm going to keep you, I have a big uh, belief in God, so I'm going to keep everybody in my prayers and wishing everybody to be fine. And it seems that at least here in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, we're moving in the right direction. And hopefully that's the same for the entire world because we're not going to survive this. We're not going to go through this alone. We're together on this and we cannot leave anybody behind. Thank you, Diego. And, and in fact, yes, let me reiterate, uh, the center is here for uh, any connection that you think that we might be able to make, anything, any resource that you think that we might have at your, uh, you know, disposal, uh, anything that we have that we can do, we will try very hard to do. And if not, try to connect you to somebody or a group or an institution that might be able to help you better than we can. So that's one of our big functions and one of our, uh, one of the things that we're most proud of that we try and connect the community. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. As I said, uh, the recording will be made available and
just once again, Diego, thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you.